Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Thank you. Welcome to the Ventura Center for Spiritual Living in these unusual times where we're just here one minute, gone the next minute, whatever. <laughs> it's a pleasure to see those of you who showed up, and for those of you that chose to stay home, that's, I'm sure that's a wise decision for you, and we support all, all responses to this interesting time that we're living in. Uh, I just want to say that we're prepared to have a great time today. We're here to love and to laugh and to be that center of love that we are. We've got Gia singing for us today, filling in for Ray Davis, who accidentally double booked himself. We've got Brock on sound and our regular sound team, the, the regular tech team. We've got Hugh doing a reading. We've got Susan Burrell on pulpit. Did I leave anybody out? All of the people that are working tire tirelessly behind the scenes to make this happen. We're just so grateful for all of you. And most of all, we're grateful for those of you who took time out of your Sunday morning. And if you take time later on in the day to watch this, to participate in spreading our message of love around the world. So thank you so much. And let us begin with a message from our brother, Bill Hadras, for Youth and Family. Good morning. I'm Bill Hadras with the Youth and Family. You want to come on down? Any children, come on down. <laughs> hey, kiddo. <laughs> hey. You can stand up here behind me. Right? That way they can see you at home. Okay. <laughs> All right. So this week, Miss Susie sent a beautiful message, and I especially liked, every, it said, every minute we spend wishing we had someone else's life is a minute wasting ours. If you look around, look around right now if you want, there will always appear to be someone to have more or less than you. A loving life begins by loving yourself. This inner light of love is like the North Star. It is always there to help guide us through life's adventures and our misadventures. Connecting to our inner light lets us use our feelings as a beacon towards our destiny or life's purpose. So what should we do when we feel a lack of love? Well, start by appreciating where you are right now. Don't compare yourself to others. The journey is yours. Who wants to tell me something good about themselves? Do you want to tell me something? I think I'm good because I don't give up at anything I ever try. Wow. Awesome. Thank you, Eva. See how easy that is? So with that, I invite you to repeat after me. I bring my own special gifts to life's party. And so it is. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. It's my pleasure to introduce Reverend Susan Burrell, who will lead us in prayer. Good morning. Good morning. So let's just continue that beautiful <laughs> place of love and joy as the practitioners and any ministers in the room stand in this prayer, joining heart to heart and hand to hand, whether you're in the sanctuary or watching from the comfort of your home. So just taking a deep breath and dropping into the center of your being, into your heart that holds all the love, all the wisdom that you are. And just feel as you breathe that love that you are. And with each breath, feel that love extend beyond your physical being to connect to each and every one who is near you, known or unknown. And feel that love just circulate as it grows with joy, with laughter, with fun. And so I know this day is already sanctified. I know it is because we are that love. And I know as we continue to move forward in this service, love just amplifies and grows and makes all 
that is unlike love just soften and simply melt away knowing that the infinite presence of source energy is within each of us always fills every molecule of being on this planet i know that we are gifted in every moment with each breath the divine presence of love so knowing that that is so always and already i celebrate this time together i celebrate this wisdom and knowledge of love as the divine source of our being and with gratitude and humility i simply release this word into that law of love knowing that this entire service unfolds with joy with laughter and with love and so i simply let it be and together we say and so it is and so it is and so we allow it to be as we settle deeper into our seats and into our inner sanctuary breathing deeply into our heart center as we listen to the words of our sacred reading by Dilgo Kyentse Rinpoche. What we normally call the mind is the deluded mind, a turbulent vortex of thoughts whipped up by attachment, anger, and ignorance. This mind, unlike enlightened awareness, is always being carried away by one delusion after another. Thoughts of hatred, or attachment suddenly arise without warning triggered by such circumstances as an unexpected meeting with an enemy or a friend and unless they are immediately overpowered by the proper antidote they quickly take root and proliferate reinforcing the habitual predominance of hatred or attachment in the mind and adding more and more karmic patterns. Yet however strong these thoughts may be, they are just thoughts and will eventually dissolve back into emptiness. Once you recognize the intrinsic nature of the mind, these thoughts that seem to appear and disappear all the time can no longer fool you. Just as clouds form, last for a while and then dissolve back into the empty sky, so deluded thoughts arise, remain for a while, and then vanish into the voidness of the mind. <laughs> In reality, nothing at all has happened. When sunlight falls on a crystal, lights of all colors of the rainbow appear. Yet they have no substance that you can grasp. Likewise, all thoughts in their infinite variety, devotion, compassion, harmfulness, and desire are utterly without substance. There is no thought that is something other than voidness. If you recognize the void nature of thoughts at the very moment they arise, they will dissolve. Attachment and hatred will never be able to disturb the mind. Deluded emotions will collapse by themselves. No negative actions will be accumulated. So, no suffering will follow. And so let us breathe into that knowing that our thoughts only have power if we give them power through repetition. Or we breathe into the knowing of the source that we are, the blank canvas upon which all thoughts arise the spirit of awakened consciousness, 
the I am presence. remember collectively together that the I am presence is another name for all that is another name for God another name for love and this presence this I am presence is omnipresence and because it is omnipresence we are one with that and so we breathe into that knowing allowing that knowing to fill every cell of our body Allow it to fill our breath, allowing it to fill our mind, our being, our actions. And then we radiate that inner knowing of the I am presence to all beings everywhere. We circulate it to our community, to our spiritual community, to our community of the world, to the entire infinite cosmos knowing as we circulate the I am, it circulates back through us, reminding us that there is only one. There has always only been one. It is that way now, and it ever shall be. We take a moment to rest in that awareness. And then we breathe in deeply and exhale, opening our eyes in love and in service to what is exactly as it is. And so it is. Namaste. Good morning.
Thank you so much. Gia, our rock star. Hi, Gia. What you doing? <laughs> our rock star adjacent soloist. <laughs> and our wonderful band, Chris Kimbler and the cat, David Parlato. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, y'all, I'm going to read you a story today. I often speak without notes, but I want to get this one right. So I'm going to speak with notes. OK? Sound good? You all right with that? You probably want me to get it right, don't you? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So I'm going to start by first asking you a question. Does anybody here know who Bob Ross is? It was, I guess. He's deceased now. Bob Ross. Oh, some of you do know. Okay. So Bob Ross, he was the host of a PBS TV, TV show from the 80s and early 90s. Yes, I see some, some recognition lighting up in people's faces. And Bob taught people how to paint landscapes. He had um, a very unique hairstyle. There he is. <laughs> hey, Bob. Can you all see him? OK, good. He had a very unique hairstyle, which I, it turns out I read about him, and it said he, he actually got tired of that hairstyle, but it was part of his brand, so he couldn't, he couldn't get rid of it. So I know how that is. <laughs> anyway, he, he said that he always wanted to paint pleasant landscapes. And he said, if you want to see something bad, watch the news. But he chose to paint pleasant landscapes, happy clouds, and happy trees. The thing about Bob, though, is that he painted super fast. He could paint an entire landscape in about an hour. It's remarkable. And it occurred to me that as I was contemplating yesterday, I was contemplating the holy spiritual traditions of the world and Bob Ross, um, <laughs> that Bob's fast painting style is very much like our relationship with reality. A thought springs into our minds, and immediately we paint a picture around it, don't we? 
We paint a picture around it. It's lightning speed. And we do this constantly and casually and unconsciously. We don't even know that we're doing it. It's the normal operating system for the mind, but we don't even know that we're painting pictures in our mind all of the time because it's so familiar to us. It's just the way we work. I want to give you an example of how this happened in, in my life recently. A few months ago, I went to see a physical therapist for a shoulder injury. And um, I don't know if you guys have noticed this trend, but is it true that they're licensing high school students to be doctors <laughs> and physical therapists? They're getting younger and younger. I just don't understand it. <laughs> anyway, this youngster, this child of a physical therapist asked me, Bonnie, how did you injure your shoulder? And I said, I picked up my bunny and I saw it. I watched her paint a picture in her mind. I saw her see me as grandmama from the Adams family, staggering under the weight of a tiny cot. Oh, there she is. <laughs> no, grandmama, right? That first. She saw me as that. Now let's go back to the, in a minute, I'll, I'll cue the bunny picture, okay? She saw me staggering under the weight of a tiny cottontail, so I leapt in with my own painting of reality. This juvenile physical therapist thinks that I am old like that. <laughs> I said to myself, and I don't want her to give me the geriatric exercises. I want her to give me the really hard exercises for homework so I can ignore those too. <laughs> and <laughs> so I said to the physical therapist, let me clarify. And I whipped out my phone and I scrolled to a picture. When I say bunny, I mean this. And I held up a picture of our rabbit, Hip Hop, a.k.a. Hip Hop the Hut. <laughs> 22 pounds of muscle and defiance. That's our hip hop. <laughs> But you see what we do, don't you? We paint these pictures all the time. I got news for you all. We're Bob Ross. We are Bob Ross. We've got a frizzy brown perm on our heads, and we're painting landscapes on a public broadcasting system. And we're faster than Bob Ross in terms of making up scenarios in a fraction of a second. And we think that these scenarios are real. But the real question for all of us this morning, as you contemplate your life, is do you paint a picture of love or do you paint a picture of lack? Many of us paint pictures of lack. In metaphysical teachings, we're taught to say things like, God is abundant. I am one with God, therefore I am abundant. And that's true. I believe that with all of my heart. And yet, still, the habit of my human mind, the habit of our human mind, still paints pictures of lack. Because those pictures of lack can be compelling, hypnotic even. Sometimes we create pictures of personal lack. We lament what is missing from our lives. We could be missing finances, or a nice home, or connections with others, or any form of goodness. And on a broader scale, COVID has exposed other perceptions of lack. Lack of resources, lack of COVID tests, lack of health and well-being, lack of hospital beds and health care, In some cases, lack of prosperity. In some countries, lack of food because the supply chain has been drastically affected. And overall, I think, COVID aside, that many, many people are experiencing a lack of certainty in these times. The world is changing. We can't control it. And we don't know what the future will be like. Our fears and uncertainties often manifest as perceptions of lack. Unhappy clouds. We're going to get light again in just a minute, but if you would, just so we can see it, take a moment to see if you can contemplate the picture that you tend to, to paint about lack in your own mind, whether it's personal or global. What are you worried about? What pictures do you form around it? Do you fill your canvas with pictures that depict a certain amount of resources, a lack of resources, a lack of certainty, a lack of feeling connected or useful? Do you have pictures of unfortunate outcomes for yourself and others? And see if you can really be specific about what you're picturing in your mind, what you're visualizing, what you're thinking, what you're feeling, and also see if you can discern what the trigger is. 
To give you a, a simple yet embarrassing solution from my own life, um, back in the day when I was singing professionally, if I went for an audition for a job that I really wanted and I didn't get the part or I didn't get a call back even, I would create a mural of scorn and self-rejection that ultimately ended with me living on the street and eating cat food out of a can. <laughs> it never happened, you know? It didn't occur to me that I would go to other resources before that happened, but I could literally see that picture in my mind's eye, and it wasn't helpful. It didn't help anything. So again, don't be shy. Just be a mess in this community, in the moment, if it suits you, here in the safety of the spiritual community. Welcome your worst picture. See yourself creating it, painting it, embellishing it. Just shine the light on that painting. Just see it. You don't have to try and push it away or whitewash it because it's just a thought. It's just something that you're making up. Remember that. Just see it. And remember that once you see it, you can embrace it. And from that place, you can heal it. You can change it. So how do we heal the scenarios that we create in our minds? In this teaching, we start by changing our inner landscape. We don't mess around with, outs here, with what's out here. We change our inner landscape. We change our thinking to change our lives. We remember. We remember that our perceptions are just thoughts, and thoughts can be changed. Today's Buddhist reading said so. It said, thoughts are just thoughts, and they will dissolve into emptiness if we allow them to dissolve into emptiness. And yes, in this teaching, we say that our thoughts create our reality. Certain our, our thoughts create our, the, qual the quality of our thoughts affect the quality of our lives. But thoughts only create when we empower them with a lot of repetition and emotion. Our thoughts create reality when we cling to them and believe that our thoughts are the only possible thoughts. And they're not. There is an infinite number of ways to think about or respond to any given situation. And then we can also take comfort in knowing that our founder, Dr. Ernest Holmes, said that trained thought, the thought that we train within ourselves, is superior to untrained thought. Those are the random thoughts that we just have. Deliberately trained thought is superior to untrained thought. We train our thoughts, and then we empower the thoughts that we want versus empowering the thoughts that frighten us. We can change our thoughts about lack pictures that we create in our minds by affirming the opposite of these frightening thoughts and thought affirmations and, and, and scenarios that we create. We can also send love to any lack scenarios that we create in our minds. I remember Reverend Susan Burrell speaking last Sunday about how she circulates love every morning, circulates compassion, and that's a powerful thing to do. You know, part of the reason that's powerful is that the origin of lack for all of us, origin of feeling lack, is fear. And so we simply extend compassion to the part of us that is afraid, just as we wouldn't punish a child, right? We would extend love to a fearful child or animal. We wouldn't punish a child or an animal for being afraid. We would love and encourage them. Dr. Martin Luther King said this about society. You know, Monday is Martin Luther King Day. Dr. King said, we must not seek to humiliate or defeat the enemy, but to win his friendship and understanding. And we can apply that to our own lives. We don't have to, to humiliate or annihilate or defeat our thoughts. We extend friendship and under understanding to the thoughts of lack that we have. We can physically feel the love circulating from our heart to the images that we conjure to every brushstroke of our fear-based paintings. And just as I said that the origin of lack is fear, and the, then the origin of fear is ignorance, and that is ignorance of our true nature. So it helps us to remember that our true nature is God's nature, the nature of pure consciousness. Pure consciousness is love, happiness, grace, peace, it's like the depths of the ocean that remains still. Even when there's waves crashing around on the surface, the depths of the ocean is still, and we, our true self is like the depths of the ocean. Consciousness is like a blank canvas. 
And we can certainly impose any unflattering or frightening picture on that blank canvas, but at any time, we can also invoke the fullness of our true self, our true being, and we can start to recreate the picture. Soon, the brush strokes that scare us will fade and eventually slip off the canvas into the native nothingness from where they came. And then sometimes, if we're holding super tightly to pictures of lack, we have to trick our ego mind. Our ego mind believes that our perception of lack keeps us safe. Eckhart Tolle says this. He says, anxiety believes that it's helping. How many of us have experienced that, right? If I just worry about this enough, then maybe I'll come up with a solution. It doesn't really work that way. You may have also heard me say in the past that worrying is like praying for that which you do not want, right? <laughs> The ego thinks it's helping through worry, and it's trying to prepare us for imminent disaster. And it does this because the egoic operating system is binary. It can't see in shades of gray. It can't see abstract possibilities. It only sees what it has known in the past. It can't see the what it considers to be impossible. It can't see what it hasn't thought of yet. Our binary nature sees everything in dark or light, good or bad, loving or lacking, and the binary nature of the ego is tenacious. At least mine is. I don't know about yours. So sometimes we have to trick the ego into letting go. One of the ways we trick the ego is through paradox. A paradox is a contradiction that confuses the dualistic thinking of the ego. An example of a paradox, it is in giving that we receive. It is in giving that we receive. In the words of St. Francis, it is in giving that we receive. The ego says, how is that possible? That doesn't make any sense. If I give away all my stuff, then I won't have anything. That is not receiving. But spiritual truth knows that it is in giving that we receive. That's one of many spiritual paradoxes. But I'll tell you the paradox that I use sometimes to tame persistent pictures of lack. This is pretty weird. I don't know if you're going to go for this, but I'll share it with you anyway, because it's that kind of a Sunday. <laughs> the paradox that I use to tame persistent pictures of lack is this. Today, I lack lack. <laughs> Does that make any sense? OK. I'm glad you said yes. It doesn't always make sense to me, but some people think it defies spiritual principle. Does it defy spiritual principle? Maybe a little, because we're told in this teaching that we're supposed to use positive words about what we want, that we sort of ignore the negative. And I, I'm learning as I mature spiritually to, to learn to embrace the negative a little bit more. Does that phrase, we lack, today I lack lack, does it trick the ego? It seems to puzzle mine. It seems to press the pause button on the paintings that I'm making, on some of, some of my more depressing paintings, and it seems to leave an opening, some kind of an opening, some kind of a vortex or aperture for something, something greater. Today, I lack lack. Here's why I think it works. What? <laughs> From a gr grammatical standpoint, it's a double negative. Sort of. <laughs> you know, I lived in the South for a long time, so I am very familiar with double negatives, such as, don't you pay that, no, never mind. <laughs> don't you pay that, no, never mind. I say that to my dog when she lurches out of the underbrush, proudly carrying the intestines of a dead cow. <laughs> Not that she killed it, but there's a cow carcass on the trail where we, where we hike, and she keeps bringing back bits and pieces of it, and it's super fun, got to tell you. So I just tell her, don't you pay that, no, never mind. Doesn't work, but I tell it to her anyway. See, I'm just lapsing into Southern. I lived in North Carolina for nine years, and I would go back there in a second if I could be here and there at the same time, but I can't. <laughs> so, anyway, <laughs> I also looked up some double negatives to share with you some examples. Um, my favorite was this one. After the nose job, she didn't want no one to see her. <laughs> Who says that? I don't understand. <laughs> That's like a Seinfeld episode. <laughs> After the nose job, she didn't want no one to see her. But there are many others. Here's one you might know. 
I can't get no satisfaction. <laughs> Thank you from our brothers and sisters. Brothers? Brothers, right? The Rolling Stones. There's no girls in the Rolling Stones? Okay. <laughs> I've just exposed my lack of knowledge of popular music, <laughs> which may not even be popular anymore. They were popular in my day. <laughs> yeah, that picture of Grandmama again? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Whoa, there she is. <laughs> That's a great picture. I really like the knives. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so a double negative is either a positive or it sounds nonsensical and therefore tricks the linear thinking of the ego and it causes Mr. Ego to pause her ranting. <laughs> Do you like my little mixture of gender there? I thought that was pretty clever in this politically correct world. <laughs> so today I lack lack. We say that. Double negative, the ego says, wait, wait, if I lack lack, it means I don't have any lack. Is that possible? And pausing an ego on a rampage can be a good thing because it gives the ego, it gets the ego to, to question the status quo. And that's a beautiful and a healing thing. That's what we have to do is question that inner status quo that continually plays in our minds over and over again and it plays so much that we think it's real. But anything that gets us to stop and pause and question it is a beautiful thing. Today, I lack lack. Another way that I think that this, this idea of today I lack lack works is that it's sort of along the lines of a principle called via negativa. See, I had to say that with a southern accent because I learned Italian and Latin in the south, so everything is like, uh, mm. oh, dimenticato molto. <laughs> That's, I've forgotten a lot in, in Italian with the southern accent. So via, let me say, try and say it right, via negativa. So I'm not an expert in via negativa, it's, it's a theological principle where we don't say what God is. We say, we feel that God is too transcendental, too vast to be contained by mere words, so we say what God is not. It's similar to the Vedic principle of neti neti, which means not this, not that. And in, in other words, God or Brahman or whichever tradition you're following, it means that, that this, this essence, this thing that we call consciousness here or awareness or God or whatever it is, love, that it's inexpressible. And, and also it allows us to not over-identify God with one thing or any other thing or any one perception or any perception of, of goodness or lack. You know, so via negativa is, a, is sort of a, another powerful thing that, that tricks the ego into letting go of its limited per perceptions of what God or the universe or abundance or lack is. I also looked up some via negativa phrases that I th and I thought I'd share my favorite one with you. <laughs> this is my favorite one. The man said to the psychic, tell me the exact place where I am going to die so I make sure I don't go there. <laughs> go figure. I don't know. I kind of love it. <laughs> More about this negative principle, though. In, in our own teaching, Ernest Holmes is teacher, who is, her name is Emma Curtis Hopkins, and she used the principle of negatives in the form of what we call denials. Really, really hardcore folks in our teaching would quote Emma as saying, there is no evil, there is no matter, there is no absence of life, substance, or intelligence in omnipresent God. And Emma would be quick to say, in God there is no lack, and so on. In God there is no lack. Now some people might take exception to these bold statements because what we experience, whether it's evil or lack or, or uh, matter, you know, it seems very real to us. Some might even find them offensive. But what I think Emma meant to say, and she, she had a very distinct way of communicating, but I think if I were to modernize those phrases a little bit, I would say that evil, matter, death, lack, all of these things, all of these are conditions of absence or nothingness. It's kind of like how darkness is the absence of light. And the only power these conditions have is the power that we give them through delusion and resistance, right? Two important words, delusion and resistance. So in this center, I think that we try and make it clearer. I would be more likely to say something like, limitations are not limitations. They seem powerful, but in the spiritual realm, they have no power. Limitations are really creativity in disguise. Obstacles are not really obstacles. They're opportunities. Or the appearance of evil is not as powerful as we want to make it because when handled with compassion, evil can form a rocket of desire for unheard of good. Lack is not lack. It is an infinite emptiness that makes space for endless possibilities. You know, I just thought of this now, too. You know, when we look at, 
at the church, at the center, we used to have, I don't know, 150 to 200 people here on a Sunday, and now we have fewer. And so we can look at that as lack, or we can look at that as people taking care of themselves and staying home when they need to. And we can look at it as an emptying that is ultimately going to create infinite possibilities for this organization and the good work that we could do in, in the world. And if it's true here, if it's true in the church and the way that we look at the sanctuary and the way that we look at, at our center, it's true for anything. The way we do anything is the way we do everything. So if there's something in your life that you can apply that principle to, to recognize that maybe we're just giving way too much power to a, a perception of lack through delusion or through resisting it, then that can change your entire life in an instant. So the last thing I said before I went off on talking about the church, it is an infinite emptiness that makes lack. Lack is not lack, it's an infinite emptiness that makes space for endless possibilities. That's a powerful one. The ego will give us the illusion, the, the ego will give the illusion of lack a lot of power. Possibly because we all carry a lot of shame. It paints the word lack with shame scenarios and it doesn't want to look at what it thinks we've done. Redefining lack destigmatizes the word. So when I say today, I lack lack, part of me goes, wait, wait, lack. Is lack a good thing or a bad thing? I lack lack. Lack is not a bad thing. It's good to lack lack. So <laughs> that healthy confusion seems to pause that inner paintbrush that wants to make us wrong for experiencing lack, and, and I'm more willing to stay on the blank canvas before embellishing it with every disaster scenario that I can possibly come up with in my small mind. Today, I lack lack. It can be a beautiful thing. It creates spaciousness where we get to wait and see what happens. So about that spaciousness, on a good day, we surrender to the spaciousness. We remember that we ourselves are not the force that paints our pictures. On an excellent day, we apply this principle of lacking lack to our friend, the pandemic. You know, it feels like there's lack and loss here, loss of freedom, loss of clarity, loss of certainty. We don't know how things are going to turn out, and the pandemic can feel like a, a vast Jackson Pollock paint splatter, splatter of lack upon humi humanity. The whole world can feel that way sometimes. But if I say to myself every day, the pandemic and its effects lacks lack, something shifts. The obstacles inherent in this current situation become potential opportunities. It starts to reveal an opening for the better yet to be, which is coming. It has to. Everything goes in cycles. And then there's this. If we pause long enough, and mindfully long enough, if we prevent ourselves from getting sucked back in to the chattering of the ego mind, the binary operating system, then there's a chance that we'll take our meaty little hands off of the paintbrush and let God be God. And let the universe fill in an infinite picture that has the capacity to bless all beings. From the book of Isaiah, we are the clay and you are the potter. We are all the work of your hand. From the book of Bonnie meets Bob Ross, <laughs> we are the paint and you are our painter. Let this unfold according to thy will and let us trust the process. So will you surrender with me today? Will you choose love over lack? Will you choose the infinite emptiness of endless possibilities? Will you choose God? And will you please repeat after me? Today I lack lack. I surrender my canvas. I surrender my paintbrush. I surrender my landscapes. I surrender my life to divine love, which is all that I am, which is all that is. And so it is. Let us pray.
And so we turn within to that divine presence, that presence that is omnipresence, that is in all things, that is in all things that we, that we see, all things that we hear, all things that we feel, all things beyond our seeing, beyond our knowing. It is a space of infinite possibilities that lives and moves and has its perfect being through the, through the universe. It is pure consciousness, it is awareness, it is not this, it is not that. It is all, it is beyond all, the all in all. It defies words, but yet we know it is real. And so we anchor in that realness right now. We allow it to fill us and inform us as to the piece of it which is vital and important for us to know right now. Our connection with it, our connection in it, our connection as it. Together we love that being and allow it to love us, knowing that we are one, knowing that it is love, loving love. And so from this place of lovingness, let us choose love over lack. Let us choose to surrender our scenarios that we come up with, our fears, our despair, our loneliness. Let us just let it go. Let us let go of any pictures that we might be creating, knowing that in the fullness of spirit, that all obstacles are opportunities, all limitations are opportunities for creativity, and all lack is endlessly infinite possibilities in the emptiness, just pregnant with possibilities, waiting to happen, waiting to pour through our lives as we open up our receptivity to it. We allow together today something greater than our small selves to open us from the inside out. We simply offer our willingness to that presence, to that allowing, and we let it be, trusting that all is well, trusting that all is well in our lives individually, and all is well in the soul of the world. And so together we affirm that we are blessed. We are blessed to be here on the planet Earth at this time. We are blessed to be light bearers. We are blessed to be love bearers. We are blessed to be filled with compassion for all that is. We give thanks for the transformation that is taking place here right now in this sacred sanctuary and beyond. We give thanks for the transformation as we participate in it through our conscious awareness, through a conscious awareness of the greater yet to be that is emerging through all of what is happening now. We give thanks for this teaching. We bless all paths to God, churches, synagogues, temples, mosques, ashrams, fundamentalists, atheists, all beings everywhere, for all beings are a blessing. We give thanks for our brother, Dr. Martin Luther King, who inspired us with his words, and may his message continue to resonate through us as we navigate the coming times, the coming days, the coming years. With a heart that is so filled with gratitude and so filled with love, I say thank you. Thank you for all of this. Thank you for this time together. Thank you for love. Thank you for God. And I release these words into the divine mystery. And together we say, and so it is.